Well, this is going to be most definitely the last gaming pickups episode for the year and also just one of the last videos I'll be making for this year. Mega Man Amiibo. Yeah. You know, I never thought I would like see one of these things ever again. I saw it like once back in like February of 2015 and I haven't seen it since until I just happened to find this at an EB Games. Apparently this EB Games, along with a few other locations, had just got a bunch of Amiibos. Like the employee there was just saying like, oh yeah, we just got a bunch of like Pits and Lucinas, just a bunch of random shit. And maybe even some, you know, Nesses. Yeah. So it's really awesome to have this Mega Man Amiibo. I really wanted this because, you know, I have, like, Mario, Sonic, and Pac-Man. And I think it would look cool to throw Mega Man in there, have them all four, you know, like, displayed or some shit. But really awesome to finally get that. Uh, I got a NES controller here. Now, the thing is, I did kind of recently purchase a second NES controller back in December. Um, but that controller was fucking... You know, to say it's a piece of shit would be, you know, an insult, an understatement. Because that controller was, like, worn out and stuff. Uh, because I bought it off of eBay from Lukey Games. And if you're buying an NES controller from them or just an NES controller off of eBay and a lot, it's kind of a crapshoot because you don't know what the con condition of the controller is going to be. So I ended up trading in that controller. Uh, went to a, you know, game store. Saw that they had a few NES controllers, and I picked out the best one. This one's pretty good. It's just that um, the D-pad feels just a tad stiff, and uh, yeah, this back is scratched to fucking forever and ever. But uh, still, uh, really nice to finally have another NES controller. And man, am I glad to finally have this Rise of the Dragon for the Sega CD. Now, for a while, I've been just kind of getting Sega CD games for the sake of getting Sega CD games, you know, because they were cheap and to give them a nice home, but it's really hard to get the games, you know, the high quality, you know, games, like the games that people, like, are really after. And this is one of the f affordable ones. Um, Rise of the Dragon was also on the MS-DOS and the Amiga, but in my case, the Sega CD one is the most, you know, uh, feasible option. Now, Rise of the Dragon is a, you know, like a point-and-click sort of adventure kind of game. Uh, you play as this dude right here, William Blade Hunter. The whole setting is just, you know, just screams Blade Runner. I mean, it takes place in like 2050 in this cyberpunk thing. And, you know, they often refer to this guy as Blade. So, uh, yeah, you know, just all kinds of factors really make this scream Blade Runner, along with Snatcher. So that's two games on the same system that take, you know, big inspiration from the movie Blade Runner. Because there never really was a Blade Runner game, except for, like, I think on, like, the Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum. Um, it's a pretty damn cool game. Like, I haven't gotten too far in it, I don't think. But from what I've played, I really do like, you know, its setting, its, you know, just artistic design put to it and hell even the voice acting the voice acting is actually pretty damn fucking good yeah like you know being that this is an early 90s game you know you would think that the voice acting was just really cheesy like they just got some you know random like schmoes or some random game developers you know to quickly voice a few lines but Actually, for the time, and perhaps even for now, I do think they did a great job with the voice acting. You know, like, for one thing that they even did cool is uh, Cam Clark. You know, he voices William Hunter in this game. And, you know, even though in my case I've only known Cam Clark for Kratos in Tales of Symphonia and Prince Crescendo in Eternal Sonata, you know, he does, he is a really fucking good voice actor. And, you know, hey, he does a great job here. And, you know, just overall, it's really fucking badass it's a really fucking badass game you know i would definitely recommend it you know even if you're not into this genre you should pick it up anyways because it's a f it's a little it's affordable compared to a lot of other sega cd games and you'll definitely get a kick out of it check it out okay now we got a couple ps2 games here we have spider-man thing is i've actually owned this already i've owned this since um like 2013 my friend joshua gave me this case and the disc here's the thing though the disc that he originally gave me which i don't have out here right now was like scratched the fucking hell and it didn't include the manual so i looked on ebay i found an auction for both the manual and the disc for like seven bucks 
and I bought myself a replacement disc and a manual so I could actually try out the game. I did very briefly. Um, and you know, I saw the whole game through SGB, the SGB playthrough, the Super Gaming Brothers playthrough, and honestly, it doesn't look as good as I thought it would have been. I'm not saying it looks bad, but Spider-Man 2 definitely blows it out of the water for sure. Here we have uh, EverQuest Online Adventures. I mainly got this because I found this at like a pawn shop or whatever, or like a Goodwill type of store. Um... You know, because I thought it was worth something, and, uh, well, it's kind of not really, because it's an MMO, and, uh, you know, the servers have been shut down for about, uh, four years now. Uh, you know, internet connection required, EverQuest, online ventures, all that shit. I, I would think that this might be worth something. It really isn't, but currently owning it now, it's nice to own, I guess, as a piece of history, you know, in the PS2's, you know, like, massive library and whatnot. Um, but yeah, because the servers are shut down, this game is pretty much unplayable. There's nothing you can do other than fiddle around with the menus. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much just a coaster or perhaps a piece of history to talk about in my eventual PS2 retrospective. And, uh, hey, at least I can say I own another, uh, at least I can say I own an MMO, MMO you know, that's, that's a first in my entire collection. And here's uh, probably my favorite PS2 game that I've bought here. Not my favorite PS2 game, but something cool. Uh, this is The Bouncer. Now, The Bouncer, I it was attracted to because I saw this in uh, one of Pete Doerr's uh, PS2 uh, collection videos. You know, his one that I think he made back in 2009. You know, he mentioned how it was a beat-em-up, and, uh, you know, it was made by Squaresoft, a.k.a. Square Enix or whatever. And, um, now, the beat-em-ups are a genre that, you know, I really, really, really need to get into more. You know, I definitely need to start getting a lot more of those. And, you know, with something like this, I thought it looked pretty damn cool. You know, it's like a 3D beat-em-up for a system that I, you know, really want to pay more attention to because the PS2 is great. You know, it looked like it had a cool, like, setting and story going on. I was like, fuck yeah, let's get it. And hell, it's by Squaresoft, so it's like, there's a lot of things you know, that basically make this game look really good. And uh, so I bought it. I beat it twice. Um, I'll explain why you might want to beat it more than once. Thing is, the game itself is short. It's only an hour long, or like maybe an hour and ten minutes long, which is uh, criminally short. You know, I mean, I know this is an early PS2 game, because this was um, the first game Squaresoft ever made for the PS2. And I guess, you know, fans were expecting them to put out an RPG and you know, they sure as fuck eventually did on the PS2, but, uh, yeah, I guess that was kind of a potential letdown. But because the game is so short, it just kind of eh. But the thing is, the game encourages, encourages you to play more than once, because they want you to, I guess, do full playthroughs as all three characters. Because between each stages, you have a choice of playing as, you know, either Sion, Ko, or Volt. Depending on who you pick, it does make slight changes to, you know, the outcome of the storytelling. Not so much really the ending, just storytelling. Oh, well, actually, the ending does change slightly. So there are some, like, bits and pieces that would warrant you to play the whole game as, say, Sion, or play the whole game as Ko, or whatever. There's also, like, leveling up in between and whatnot, so you can do, like, a new game plus, so you can basically get yourself stronger and stronger for those multiple playthroughs. The stages themselves are also really short. A lot of them last, like, probably about, like, 40 seconds, maybe, <laughs> you know? Which, uh, sure, there's a decent amount of stages, and there are a select few stages that actually do last about a minute or so, but I don't really get why the stages are so damn short. Because, you know, they do have a good balance between stages and cutscenes for, I guess, a game as short as it is, but they really should have made the stages at least maybe a minute long or something. Because it's like, oh, what's that? I just beat up four enemies. Oh, well, now I'm already onto the save screen and onto the next cutscene, which is just kind of, well, that was some shit. Uh, the Bouncer is a pretty cool game. Uh, you know, might, might be one of my favorite PS2 games, hard to say, uh, not one of the best necessarily, I think something like Urban Rain by Namco, another beat-em-up, might blow this out of the water, but it is definitely a, you know, PS2 game I hold in, um, slightly higher regards, I guess. Pretty cool game, though, but, you know, yeah, it really need to be longer. Here we have, uh, 
Dissidia 12 Duo Decim Final Fantasy for the PSP. This is something my brother got, and you know, even if it's a game my brother gets and I'm not necessarily interested in, I'll at least attempt to play it, just so I can say I did. Um, I did very briefly play this. Uh, it's got very nice graphics. Um, you know, it's, uh... I'm looking through the back just because I don't know what the hell's going on, and it mentions how, like, you know, you got various characters from various Final Fantasy games. You know, you navigate a, through a world map in true RPG fashion. Um, you know, got some art tier of various characters. Is that, um, I'm trying to think of that. Is that like Yuna or uh, Yuffie or whatever? That's a Tifa, I believe. You know, I'm trying. I don't know much about Final Fantasy. Um, if I can say anything about the game, the graphics do look nice. And, you know, hey, it was a later PSP release. Um, but, yeah, I'm sorry I can't say really much about it. Other than, hey, it's definitely something nice to, I guess, see my brother play occasionally and whatnot. Interesting sort of specimens. Here we have Halo 3 for the Xbox 360. I mainly wanted this because it was, you know, it's cheap. Because Halo 3 is a very cheap game, I guess, as long as, along with, you know, Halo 1 and 2. Um, and also, when I first bought my Xbox 360, it came packaged with Halo 3, but we sold it along with a couple other Xbox 360 games. And I was like, well, for the sake of, you know, nostalgia and whatnot, let's get it back, you know, so we can say, hey, at least we own the game that came with our Xbox 360. The Halo franchise itself is something I've never really cared about, though admittedly it'd be something I'd be more willing to try out than, say, Call of Duty. You know, it definitely is one of uh, those big franchises for Microsoft, maybe perhaps a system seller, I don't know. Then again, the Xbox 360 definitely needed more exclusive games. Uh, I did play it for a little bit now, and I did play it a bit back in the day because it was one of the only Xbox 360 games we had. And uh, it's cool, um, though, it may, uh, though I'm not really into first-person shooters, and again, I'm not sure if Halo is a good starting point, f a starting point for somebody like myself, but uh, it definitely is nice to have. And, uh, yeah, you know what, I might as well talk about this. Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE for the Wii U. I'm not. I'm gonna try and not repeat what I said about this game in my Wii U four years later video. So I'll just you know get on to uh, what I'm gonna say now about it. I mentioned how the game was brutally hard for me, you know, because of how like the bosses are and how like even if you use like this, you know, the healing items and the defense and off offense raising items. And, you know, knowing when the right time to use this and that is. The thing is, I like to think that the game is probably going to be easier now. Because I have, as of now, put about like 106 hours into it. And if you're wondering why that many, well, I've been doing a shit ton of grinding. And, you know, also figuring out all the side quests. Because in order to get the true ending of the game, you have to do all the side quests. In fact, there's no reason why you shouldn't. Because the side quests definitely give you cool stuff like duo arts to make the game that much easier. When I first played it, I initially thought this was going to be a really, you know, like, smooth sailing sort of game. Because, you know, the turn-based system, the fact that it was a turn-based RPG kind of, like, uh, gave me, you know, cautious uh, cautious views on it. But I played it, you know, for a few hours when I first got it, and I was like, holy shit, this, this actually seems like this would be, like, you know, really smooth sailing. This would be really cool. And while I do think Tokyo Mirage Sessions is a great game... Because it, it does some really cool things. The setting is, you know, really nice. The characters are, you know, very cool. For one thing, I do like that, you know, say like with Subasa here, you know, in the beginning it's explained a lot how much of a fan of Kyria she is. Eventually, Kyria joins your party. And I'm glad that, you know, the writing doesn't go to, you know, Subasa being an over-obsessed, like, fangirl and Kyria's, you know, trying to talk to, like, you know, Itsuki or whatever to try and get her out of her face or something. I'm glad it's not, like, obnoxious in that sense. I mean, granted, I guess the character Barry is sort of obnoxious, but I guess that's what adds to the charm and personality of this game. Even though when you first see Barry, you know, he's like... You know, he's a strict sort of, you know, informer and teacher just trying to do his job, you know, trying to get Subasa to sing right and whatnot, but then he kind of turns into a big goofball, you know, beyond that. But this game really does cool things, you know. Again, on its charm, you know, it's like we got, you know, character 
named Mamori here. You know, she has her own show, Mike Raving with Mamorin. You know, there's because almost every character in this game is like an actor or an actress or a dancer or a singer, with the exception of Itsuki. And you know, even though this guy's name is you know spelt Itsuki, everybody pronounces it as Itsuki. I just don't understand, but okay, whatever. So one thing that this game's obviously been, you know, like when it first started off was like it says Shin Megami Tensei X Fire Emblem. And I guess as this game further got into development, it became that lesser and lesser because really when you play it, there's, it really doesn't feel like that. Maybe in elements wise, but you know, there's like very subtle things. For example, they do mention Marth at one point in the game. Uh, the shopkeeper in, you know, the Hee Ho Mart is said to be Anna from Fire Emblem Awakening. And the fourth boss is this fucker named Excelius. Though the thing is, if you look at the co the character design between Excelius in this game and Excelius in Fire Emblem Awakening, it's pretty fucking different. So I don't know how the hell, you know, Excelius is Excelius, but I guess I just have to take their word for it. Um... But yeah, despite it being really hard with the bosses and whatnot, I do still think it's a great game. When I first started it off, it said, you know, it presented you with easy, normal, and hard. I picked normal because it said, you know, oh, this is recommended for people who are playing the game for the first time. And easy really could have meant anything. And especially considering how the flow of the game was, I did not regret... Yes, the oven beeped. I did not regret picking it on normal. But, you know, I guess because of the fact that I didn't, know, didn't do all the side quests or whatever is what made the game so hard. I, it really did aggravate me, but I'm glad at this point I'm currently up to the final boss, and well, let's just hope that's not a fucking nightmare. But uh, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, you know, as I've said many times in this video, it's a great game. Maybe not the best to come off of after playing Tales of Symphonia, but it's definitely really cool to have, and easily one of the best games on the Wii U. And it's really a shame to see that the Wii U is pretty much just done for, and really the sad history that console had, because Honestly, at this point in gaming pickups, you know, you'll still see me talk about Wii U games, but how many of them are going to be, you know, actually new releases or, you know, games I bought brand new at retail. It's just, it's kind of a sad end, really. Um, Star Soldier for the NES. Uh, I haven't picked up an NES game since Con Bravo, and, you know, speaking of Con Bravo, I actually remember seeing this at Con Bravo. I looked at him like... Star Soldier, isn't that part of that, like, well-loved Hudson series? And me being a fucking idiot, I didn't pick it up. Then, now I picked it up, and I played it. I did play it before, because my friend Fabio has this game. And, uh, it's a pretty damn cool shooter. Not the best, or the most, you know, rewarding of its kind on the NES, or just in general. But it's pretty damn cool. Uh, there's like 16 stages overall, you know, you can get various power-ups, and whatnot. It definitely is something, you know, you would need to, like master and whatnot, but I don't think it's as addicting or as, you know, rewarding as a lot of other shooters, say, like, Life Force and especially Stinger, or even, like, Legendary Wings, you know, all NES games, but for what it did, it's pretty damn cool, and it's also really fucking cheap, too, so it's, you know, a nice thing to own, even though, at this point, I can't wait to get Star Soldier Vanishing Earth for the N64. Speaking of that... Here we have Virtual Pool 64 for the Nintendo 64. Um, it's pretty cool to have another boxed N64 game, especially after, well, you know, I haven't picked up a boxed N64 game since, like, October of 2014. Um, yeah, it's Pool, uh, but the thing is, it looked really fucking good. You know why? Because it looked like a really competent game, especially with the, you know, the ultra-real physics make virtual pool as close to real pool as it gets. And uh, they're not kidding. The physics in this game are, you know, really well made. And also the fact that, you know, you control your uh, aim by, going, by pulling back the analog stick and then pushing forward really adds a nice sense of, you know, realism and control to this game. And also, you know, it's just a really fucking well-made pool game and it would blow something like Championship Pool for the Super Nintendo and Genesis out of the water. And, you know, it's cool to have it in box, you know, I got it in box for, like, $15. I actually wanted specifically to get it in box, and even though there's, like, this nasty sticker residue on the N64 logo, it still is a pretty neat little thing to have. And just shows, even with the N64's, you know, small library of 388 games, there are some, there's definitely, you know, some interesting stuff worth getting, you know. And I guess this is one of them, even if you're not, like, in a pool, 
it is a very well made game. Uh, here we have Extreme G, also for the N64. I would picked up Extreme G3 for the GameCube, you know, not too long ago, and I thought that was pretty damn good. Even though my main gripe with it is that it relied on the boost a little too much, especially considering you don't get much boost in the game. This game doesn't rely on the boost as much. Um... There's uh the court there's a lot there's more courses than there are in Extreme G3 though they're a little shorter but there are some really damn good courses and just the overall racing action in general it does not disappoint supposedly Extreme G2 is a little like a bit of a letdown but I'm still gonna get it anyways because why not might as well get all three all four rather Extreme G games though the fourth game isn't called Extreme G4. This is definitely one of the best racers on the N64 and a quality title. It doesn't suffer from like, you know, oh, a lack of courses or, you know, lack of fleshing out. And also, it's got four players. And for its price point, I would definitely recommend it. Probably even the whole series, actually. Um, really good stuff. And now we have some really cool uh, Sega Genesis games. Uh, I will show them both here. Uh, here we have Jennifer Copriotti Tennis and Valis, two games published by Renovation Products. Games that I uh, had been willing to pick up ever since, you know, saw them on GameSack, though in Valis' case I saw it in the appropriately titled Donkey Kong Country and Valis series reviews. And Jennifer Copriotti Tennis I saw in their Renovation Products uh, episode. Jennifer Copriotti Tennis, um, well, it doesn't have the Jennifer Copriotti license in Europe because uh, I guess. Uh, Good old Jennifer here isn't well known enough outside of North America. In fact, has Jennifer Copriotti herself played this game before? I didn't even know who the hell she was before, you know, hearing about it. But I figured, you know, I saw it at a game store and I'm like, fuck it, you know, I don't have much money anyways, let's pick it up. Um, it's a decent tennis game, I want to say. The problem with it is that, like, it doesn't feel like I can get into the action or, like, you know, there's times where the ball misses the mark and, you know, it doesn't feel like my fault. I just, like, you know, what the hell was I supposed to do? Press A, B, or C? Am I picking the wrong course? Am I picking the wrong player? It's something I'm still trying to figure out. But overall, it doesn't seem like a bad game in general. Valis. Oh, man, am I fucking glad to have Valis. Um, now... Valis was one of those series that kind of, you know, just held my interest. It definitely seemed like something, you know, pretty cool, you know, and fun to play. The thing is, the Valis games do command above average prices, but it just seemed like one of those, you know, series in the 16-bit era that just vanished, that just stood out to me. I mean, sure, there's a lot of 16-bit era series of games that just didn't catch on or, you know, didn't live on past, like, 1995 or whatever. But something about Valis just, you know, really captivated me. I think maybe the third game, how there was a comparison to, like, Castlevania or whatever. But in the case of the first game, it's a pretty damn good game. Not the best in the series, but it isn't too frustrating. You know, it doesn't have really cheap deaths. Sure, the bosses will uh, spook you a little bit, shall we say, on your first attempts, you know, because you have to have your sword, you know, powered up at the right time. Uh, but it's really is quality, you know, sort of platforming and slashing action and you know even though it was like 60 bucks i sure as hell don't regret it and i can't wait to get the other valis um games hopefully i'll have time to talk about the series more in general uh yeah it's called valis because of the sword not because of the character the main character you control is a uh, yuko but still really cool to have and definitely the most i've ever spent on a sega genesis game 60 holy shit